It's good to be together. It's good to hear so much, uh, so many voices saying hello to one another. Uh, and uh, we're, we're grateful for uh, gathering together. Uh, just a few announcements before we're called into worship. Uh, the first of which is we had VBS this week, uh, and it went really well. And there were so many uh, people here in our church that uh, really sacrificed a lot of time to serve our kids and, and to serve kids that are coming from outside of our church. And uh, we're so thankful for the gospel that was preached uh, to our, our kids this week. Uh, the next announcement is uh, you'll notice in your bulletin that there is uh, that, that sheet of paper that has our uh, service opportunities. Uh, we'd love to have you join um, our, our service team in, in a variety of different capacities. Those are list, listed there, the, the urgent needs that we have. So if you'd fill that out uh, and uh, drop that in the offering box, we'd love to follow up with you and see you uh, serve here at the church. Uh, the next thing is we're going to have a worship night, a worship and prayer night. Call, we're calling it Seeking His Face. Uh, that's going to be Wednesday, August 16th at 630 down in the Fellowship Hall. And it's really coming out of Psalm 27, which is talking about uh, the psalmist who, who longs to gaze upon the beauty of the Lord and to inquire in his temple and to seek his face. And so we're going to both sing and pray and intercede for, for our church and for the world and uh, and gaze upon his beauty together. So we'd love to have you there for that uh, worship night. But to the weak who are tired and need strength, to the wounded who are broken and long to be whole, and to the wayward who are lost and far from home, we welcome you in the name of the living Jesus. Please stand and receive this call to worship from Psalm 150. Praise the Lord. Praise God in his sanctuary. Praise him in his mighty heavens. Praise him for his mighty deeds. Praise him according to his excellent greatness. Praise him with the trumpet sound. Praise him with the lute and harp. Praise him with tambourine and dance. Praise him with strings and pipe. Praise him with sounding cymbals. Praise him with loud clashing cymbals. Let everything that has breath praise the Lord. Praise the Lord. Well, we gather this morning to make much of our God, the one who has come to us with might and with mercy. And he is worthy of all of our praise. So as we gather together, we gather in the love of his son who has poured out his life even unto death and is now risen and reigning uh, in heaven. He's worthy of our praise. Let's sing together. Praise to the Lord, the Almighty, the King of creation. Oh, my soul, praise him for him. Breath come now with praises. 
Amen. Hear these words from 1 Peter chapter 5. Humble yourselves, therefore, under the mighty hand of God, so that at the proper time he may exalt you, casting all your anxieties on him because he cares for you. Be sober-minded, be watchful. Your adversary, the devil, prowls around like a roaring lion, seeking someone to devour. Resist him, firm in your faith, knowing that the same kinds of suffering are being experienced by your brotherhood throughout the world. The call to us this morning is to bow, to bow before the Lord. And as we bow, we bow with a promise that God is not going to come and crush us in Jesus Christ. Rather, he comes to comfort us. And in that promise, we cast our anxieties on him. Really, the command here is to tell God our need, to tell God what makes us afraid, what burdens us, trusting that, that he is not like the devil who is prowling around us like a roaring lion, seeking to devour us. Rather, he's a merciful savior. And yet, the hard thing is we often run away from the Lord when we are in need and when we're weak and we're burdened. Uh, we go to other things. We seek to, to rely on our own strength. And, and so this morning, we, we return to the Lord. Uh, we return from all of our idols that we worship. We return from our reliance, our self-reliance, and uh, we receive his mercy this morning. It's, it's because he calls us into the light. So let's take some time um, to uh, silently uh, confess to the Lord personally. Lord, we confess this morning that in our, in our fear and need and burden, Lord, we so often run away from you rather than humbling ourselves before you. Independence, we, we seek independence, and we do what's wise in our own eyes, and uh, we, we try and, and bear up underneath our anxieties rather than running to you. And so we confess that. We pray that you would have mercy on us and that you would forgive us for our sin, that you would welcome us home, Lord. And we're so thankful that as a loving father, even when we run away from you, you chase us down in love uh, to redeem us and forgive us of our sin in your son. Uh, we are so thankful for your steadfast love. In Jesus' name, amen. Hear this uh, from that same passage in 1 Peter uh, chapter 5, verse 10. After you have suffered a little while, the God of all grace who has called you to his eternal glory in Christ will himself restore, confirm, strengthen, and establish you. Though the enemy seeks to destroy you, the Lord comes to comfort you, to provide for you, to confirm you. And as you bow, he doesn't uh, stomp you out, but he honors you. And even in, in, in due time, he will exalt you. Um, your future in Jesus Christ, if you are in Jesus Christ, your future is eternal glory. And your present now is stable ground, as he is our firm foundation. And we're going to sing a song about Christ as our firm foundation. It's a new song, um, and so it might take a little bit for you to learn it. Um, if you don't know it, um, just, just listen. Um, just hear the, the, the voice of, of the people around you, the, the singing of the people around, me, around you as you uh, as you hear about Christ as our firm foundation, let's sing together. Christ is my firm foundation, the rock on which I stand when everything around me is shaken. I've never been more glad that I put my faith in Jesus, cause he's never let me down, he's faithful through generations, he's 
times of grief shall not be My name is Benjamin. I'm one of the pastors here, and I'm going to be leading us in our pastoral prayer. I'll just, a few things to say before that. One, um, we went away for a bit, and uh, it was nice to be a pastor who just sits out there, and if something breaks, no one knows that I'm a pastor, (laughs) Uh, and I have no responsibilities. But what's better uh, is to be home, to be home worshiping with uh, church family. Um, Two very brief announcements. Um, One, uh, those of you who have been following the church softball trajectory all summer, you'll be happy to know we successfully won the championship. So we will be praying for the other churches in the city here this morning (laughs) um, who are all mourning. Um, And one other one, just to say very briefly, is Ron Smith, the pastor we hired um, June 4th. He's been a longtime missionary with his family uh, in Milan, Italy but he's from South Carolina. They are uh, in the final stages of of their time there in the last couple weeks, honestly. And so just continue to pray that his house would sell and they're they're packing up things um, and should be coming mid-August to the States, he he hopes and we believe, Um, and then to us as a church mid-September, we hope. So um, that's something to be praying about. Jesus, we were singing about uh, firm foundations. Jesus has a parable about building on the sand and building on a firm foundation. Just one line from that Matthew 7. And the rain fell and the floods came and the winds blew and beat on that house, but it did not fall because it had been founded on the rock. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, we confess that too often we build on sandy foundations. But Lord, we thank you that that our our truest foundation, when we are in you, when we are one of your children, when you have brought us into your family through Jesus Christ, our house is built upon a rock. That the gospel doesn't move. Wind and rain, the, the, the tides of culture come and go. And your house, your 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 foundation holds firm. We thank you so much for that. We pray for Ron Smith and his wife Amy and as they're wrapping up things after a long career of faithfully serving you in Milan, Italy. And I, I pray for a sweetness in his time there with the people he's been serving with, the agency, mission agency he's been working with, that there would just be sweet memories of the way you, you were that rock for them and for the people he was serving among. I pray for the things he asked us to pray for, the the selling of a house, the packing up of goods, the the saying of goodbyes, and that you would bring him here to the States to to visit churches and to other people and and, and to our own church um, here in really just a handful of weeks. So we pray for all of that, and 
We just pause to thank you for all the missions work that's been happening across the summer, whether Vacation Bible School, as we see the church still decorated, or the youth who made a trip to Miami and back safely and served you there, Volker and uh, Mike, who went over to Romania and back to visit missionaries there, the trip that went to the team that went down to Kentucky. There's been so many things, including work days down at the church plant. We just lay this all before you and pray that through all our efforts, it would be a building upon the rock that is Christ Jesus. In his name we pray. Amen. I may stand up and read the scripture passage then. Can I do that for you? Actually, there's something, we're going to do something different that I've always wanted to do. Is there any member of the church who would like to read it? This is, this is, this is tough on the spot. Okay. Mike Grenier, okay, you want to do it because you've been thinking about it a ton. Why don't you do it? All right, you can be a hero. <laughs> yeah, I'll leave it up there. I'm in Matthew 7, but you can flip to Genesis. <laughs> there you go. All right, Genesis chapter 15. After these things, the word of the Lord came to Abram in a vision. Fear not, Abram, I am your shield. Your reward shall be very great. But Abram said, O Lord God, what will you give me? For I continue childless. And the heir of my house is Eliezer of Damascus. And Abram said, Behold, you have given me no offspring, and a member of my household will be my heir. And behold, the word of the Lord came to him. This man shall not be your heir. Your very own son shall be your heir. And he brought him outside and said, Look toward heaven and number the stars, if you're able to number them. Then he said to him, so shall your offspring be. And he believed the Lord, and he counted it to him as righteousness. And he said to him, I am the Lord who brought you out of Ur of the Chaldeans to give you this land to possess. But he said, O oh Lord God, how am I to know that I shall possess it? He said to him, Bring me a heifer three years old, a female goat three years old, a ram three years old, a turtle dove and a young pigeon, and he brought him all these, cut them in half, and laid each half over against the other. But he did not cut the birds in half. And when birds of prey came down on the carcasses, Abram drove them away. As the sun was going down, a deep sleep fell on Abram, and behold, dreadful and great darkness fell upon him. Then the Lord said to Abram, know for certain that your offspring will be sojourners in a land that is not theirs and will be servants there, and they will be afflicted for 400 years. But I will bring judgment on the nation that they serve, and afterward they shall come out with great possessions. As for you, you shall go to your fathers in peace. You shall be buried in a good old age, and they shall come back here in the fourth generation, for the iniquity of the Amorites is not yet complete." When the sun had gone down and it was dark, behold, a smoking fire pot and a flaming torch passed between these pieces. On that day, the Lord made a covenant with Abram, saying, to your offspring, I give this land from the river of Egypt to the great river, the river Euphrates, the land of the Kenites, the Kenizzites, the Cadmonites, the Hittites, the Perizzites, the Rephaim, the Amorites, the Canaanites, the Girgashites, and the Jebusites. This is God's word. Good morning. Uh, my name is Tony. I'm one of the pastors here, too. Um, I'm going to start out this morning uh, asking a question. If you could ask God for anything, what would it be? What would you ask for? Uh, think about it. This is, it's sort of like the question, if you had one wish, what would you wish for? And I know everyone says more wishes, right? 
Well, the problem with you or me having an infinite number of wishes is this. We are limited. Limited with what we know. Limited in how we love. My wife and I, we like to go to the swimming pool, go to the beach, play tennis, hike, outdoor stuff. I think if we had a wish, it might be that it would never rain. But it wouldn't be long before the food we eat, the trees that give us oxygen, would begin to die off. We're limited in how we love. Imagine if all of our wishes for the people that cut us off in traffic would come true. The people who've hurt us in any way. Imagine if, if those wishes would come true. This desire for unlimited wishes reflects that part of us that believes if I were in charge of things, life would be awesome, right? But then there's that part of us that knows better, hopefully, that makes us say, Glad I don't have to run the world. Hopefully this morning, I'll convince you that there is one answer to that question. What would you wish for? That's better than all the rest. There's something that God is willing to give us that's so amazing, it's hard to believe. I've titled this sermon, When God's Word is Hard to Believe. And If you're honest, when you're reading the Bible or you're listening to someone talk about the Bible... There's parts of God's word that are hard to believe. The Red Sea parting down the middle so that thousands of slaves can walk through to freedom on dry ground. A big fish swallows a guy and spits him out just where God wants him. A man walks on a raging sea and then tells it to be still and it obeys him. These things defy our understanding of how the natural world is supposed to work. And what is your response when that happens? When God's word is hard to believe, what do you do? Dismiss it? Or do you ask God to help you? Do you ask anyone to help you? My hope and prayer this morning is that this message will help you. Help you to believe something that's hard to believe. And will you pray with me? Father God, you are... uh, you are such a good God, Lord, that you, you not only call us to believe, Lord, but you give us the faith. You give us everything we need to believe you. And uh, I just pray that, that this morning as I preach your word, Lord, uh, what you want the people of our congregation to hear, Lord, will, will go deep into their hearts, their minds, their souls. Father God, may we be changed by your word this morning. May, may we be changed by you and conform to the likeness of your son. And it's in his name we pray. Amen. So we're continuing our series looking at the life of Abraham. In this 15th chapter of Genesis, uh, we see Abram in a conversation with God. And it might be a little confusing as to why the sermon series refers to Abraham, while so far he's being called Abram rather than Abraham. Well, we'll see in chapter 17 that God gives Abram a new name, Abraham. But for now, his name's Abram. So last week, Pastor Mike took us through chapter 14, where we read that Abram's nephew, Lot, is in big trouble. Lot, along with his family, his possessions, have been captured by an army led by four kings. Abram assembles 318 of his men and pursues this army. God gives Abram the victory, and he rescues Lot, Lot's people, and Lot's stuff. So it's unlikely that the armies of these four kings are happy with Abram, as we pick up here in chapter 15. And it's likely that Abram, fearing retaliation, is afraid. Chapter 15 starts out with God coming to Abram in a vision and saying, Do not be afraid, Abram. I am your shield, Your reward shall be very great. Here we see God giving Abram his word. God is letting Abram know that as he fulfills the promises he's made to Abram, Abram will have his protection. To this point in Abram's journey, God has promised a few things. In chapter 12, he tells him he'll 
He'll make of him a great nation. He will bless him and make his name great. He will make Abram a blessing to others. And now in chapter 15, God is giving Abram his word that he will be his shield. And don't miss this, his very great reward. So what is this great reward? I told you at the start of the message that I would give you the answer to what it is you should wish for if you had one wish. And here it is. It's God himself. Is that the answer to the question you would give if you had one thing to wish for? Would it ever occur to you to ask God to give you himself? And how does God do it? How does he give himself to us, and why is it such good news? I hope if that isn't clear to you already, it will be this morning. And if it's already clear, I hope being reminded of it will bless your soul. I'm often amazed at the parts of the Bible that people say they find hard to believe, while totally ignoring other parts that to me seem way harder to believe. My guess is that a lot of people have not really looked at the amazing claims the Bible makes. While there are many amazing claims made in the Bible, none of them come close to the claim of Scripture that God in Jesus Christ gives us himself, and he does it as a gift. I'm going to read Ephesians 2, 8, and 9. It says, For by grace you have been saved through faith, and this, not your own doing, it is the gift of God, not a result of works, so that no one may boast. Is this hard to believe? Are there parts of God's word that you find hard to believe? I'll share one that gave me trouble for years and how through many difficult years, God helped me to see that it's true. It's Romans 8.28. I think most of us have heard this verse quite a few times, and maybe you'll agree with me. It's one of those that's hard to believe. It says, and we know that... For those who love God, all things work together for good. For those who are called according to his purpose. All things work together for good, huh? All things. So about 20 years ago, I'm around 38 years old. 20 years ago. (laughs) Make that clear. (laughs) I'm with my two sons who were at the time 8 years old and 12 years old. We're at a, a summer camp for kids in Somerset, PA, for a week with a few other children from this church and a few kids from the Boys and Girls Club in Harrisburg and some adults from this church as well. We're, we're up there as counselors, the adults. I'm called into the camp office for a phone call. It's my wife. She's received the results from the biopsy of her liver and it's cancer. And I'm devastated. I leave the camp office. I lay down on a bench. I look up at the sky, and it felt like the sky was spinning. I don't tell my boys. We have, we have two more days left at camp, and I want them to enjoy themselves. And I know there are some difficult days ahead. And over the next months, she starts chemo. Her hair begins to fall out. I have to take the clippers. and shave her head. While my two sons watch with tears rolling down their face. And I think all things work together for good. Almost three years go by, long days, long nights. Mother's Day approaches and my boys and I decide We're going to make a video for their mother as a gift. I record them telling her all the things they love and appreciate about her. We finish it, and Mother's Day comes, and my sons wait in the living room eagerly, anticipating showing this video to their mom. There's only one problem. She's passed away very early that morning in bed. And I have to go out to the living room and tell my two boys on Mother's Day, that their mom has gone to be with Jesus. This is one of the hardest days of my life. 
And as I would recall it from time to time, my thought would be, all things work together for good. Really? All things work together for good? It's hard to believe. How could anything good come out of something that felt so bad? Well, over the last 18 years, God has shown me many times how he can take the hardest things in our lives and use them for a good purpose. Having gone through that experience with my late wife, I've been able to provide some measure of comfort to people going through something similar. Just this past fall, our church started a program called Grief Share. It's geared toward helping people who have lost a loved one look to God to go through the grieving process. Myself, along with David McHale, Deb Davis, Katie Iberson, led a group of about 15 people who had lost loved ones through a 12-week course. And because God had brought all of us through difficult losses, we were uniquely able to help others. I could sincerely thank God that the difficult time he had brought me through was not without a good purpose. 2 Corinthians 1.4 tells us, God comforts us in all our affliction so that we may be able to comfort those who are in any affliction with the comfort with which we ourselves are comforted by God. Because God had comforted me through those hard years, I was able to comfort others. And we can see this play out in Abram's life in the previous chapters. Abram gives his wife to another man out of fear for his life, and God graciously delivers his wife back to him along with material wealth, despite Abram having made such a terrible decision. So when Abram hears of his nephew Lot's trouble, he doesn't hesitate to help. God has instilled in Abram the faith to believe that it's good to help those in need, even if it's not your fault that they're in trouble. So now here in chapter 15, Abram is responding to God's promise of protection and great reward with some doubt. Verses 2 and 3, Abram speaking to the Lord, <clears throat> sorry, Abram speaking to the Lord says, O Lord God, what will you give me? For I continue childless. And the heir of my house is Eleazar of Damascus. Eleazar is a servant of some sort in Abram's house. Uh, the Bible doesn't tell us exactly what kind. Abram says, Behold, you've given me no offspring, and a member of my household will be my heir. In verses 4 and 5, Behold, the word of the Lord came to him. This man shall not be your heir. Your very own son shall be your heir. And he brought him outside and said, Look toward heaven and number the stars. <laughs> kind of cool this is up here. If you are able to number them, I don't know if you've ever looked up into a really dark sky where you see just how many stars there are um, that you probably never see around here, but there's a lot. And he said to him, so shall your offspring be. God is graciously, patiently giving Abram his word again because it's obvious that Abram's having some trouble believing. It's important to notice here that Abram doesn't pretend. He doesn't act like he's confident when he isn't. Instead, he says to God, basically, from where I'm standing, it doesn't look like your word is true. You said I'd be a great nation, and I still don't even have one child of my own. God doesn't hit him with a lightning bolt. Instead, he takes him outside, points him to the sky, and restates his promise. We see Abram's response in verse 6. He believed the Lord, and he counted it to him as righteousness. How can a person have a right standing with a holy God? How can a person guilty of sin be justified? Simple. Take God at his word. Of all the things God says in his word, this one seems to give us the most trouble. And yet the truth is explained over and over again in God's word, this doctrine of justification by faith. Faith in God's word, his son, Jesus, is considered the doctrine by which the church stands or falls. 
It's the doctrine that caused the Protestant believers to split from the Roman Catholic Church. It appears here in Genesis 15.6 for the first time. And then verse 15.6 of Genesis is quoted in Romans 4, Galatians 3, James 2. This doctrine that it is God alone who saves and we are justified by believing it is all through the Bible. In Romans 4, Paul writes, What then shall we say was gained by Abraham, our forefather, according to the flesh? For if Abraham was justified by works, he has something to boast about, but not before God. For what does the scripture say? Abraham believed God, and it was counted to him as righteousness. Now to the one who works, his wages are not counted as a gift, but as his due. And to the one who does not work, but believes in him who justifies the ungodly, his faith is counted as righteousness. The rest of that chapter of Romans Chapter 4 goes on to elaborate on this truth. And then Galatians 3 says, O foolish Galatians, who has bewitched you? It was before your eyes that Jesus Christ was publicly portrayed as crucified. Let me ask you only this. Did you receive the Spirit by works of the law or by hearing with faith? Are you so foolish? Having begun by the Spirit, are you now being perfected by the flesh? Did you suffer so many things in vain, if indeed it was in vain? Does he who supplies the Spirit to you and works miracles among you do so by works of the law or by hearing with faith? Just as Abraham believed God and it was counted to him as righteousness. And then James 2 again quotes Genesis 15, 6. Abraham believed God and it was counted to him as righteousness. James focuses on explaining the type of belief or faith that is referred to here. It's one that is confirmed by works. A belief in God's word that doesn't result in a maturing obedience to God's word is not the kind of faith shown by Abram. James states that that isn't faith at all. We see it illustrated in the passage that follows verse 6 in Genesis 15, something that to most of us living in 2023 looks very strange. First off, I'll remind you that this is an ancient culture where people don't go to the grocery store for meat that's been slaughtered, cleaned, neatly carved into nice little portions, and shrink-wrapped. If you wanted meat in Abram's day, you butchered it yourself. I remember visiting a family, visiting some of my family that lived on a farm. They had pigs and chickens. I was maybe 12 years old. I'm pretty much a city boy. And I asked them what the names of the animals were. They laughed at me. They said, we don't name the animals. We eat them. (laughs) So what happens in verses 7 through 11 may seem strange to us for several reasons. But it wasn't strange to Abram. In part because of what I just mentioned. You had to do your own dirty work if you wanted to eat meat. And secondly, because what you'll see in the following verses was a traditional way that important covenants were made between people in Abram's day. The animals would be cut in half down through the spine. The halves would be laid out on either side of a pathway. And the parties involved in the covenant would walk through these slaughtered animals, severed bodies, through their blood to ratify the covenant. This was a way of saying, if I don't keep my end of the deal, may what happened to these animals happen to me. Let's read these verses. This is 15, 7 through 11. And he said to him, I am the Lord who brought you out from Ur of the Chaldeans to give you this land to possess. But he said, O Lord, how am I to know that I shall possess it? And he said to him, bring me a heifer three years old, a female goat three years old, a ram three years old, a turtle dove and a young pigeon. And he brought him all these, cut them in half, and laid each half over against the other. But he did not cut the birds in half. And when the birds of prey came down on the carcasses, Abram drove them away. Abram would have understood God to be telling him, we're entering into a covenant, and it's a serious one. 
I'm doubtful that any of us have entered into an agreement with such heavy consequences for not keeping up our end. Imagine if that were the deal when you took out a loan to buy a car or your house, that you would say to your bank, should I fail to make my payments, may what happened to these animals happen to me. Now we just sign a legal document that states what we will or will not do in a contract, and if we don't keep up our end, the other party takes us to court, and it's unpleasant, but nowhere near as unpleasant as being cut into pieces. So is Abram willing to enter this type of covenant with God? And now we get to the wonderful part. Verse 12, as the sun was going down, a deep sleep fell on Abram. And behold, dreadful and great darkness fell upon him. Then the Lord said to Abram, know for certain that your offspring will be sojourners in a land that is not theirs and will be servants there. And they will be afflicted for 400 years. But I will bring judgment on the nation that they serve. And afterward, they shall come out with great possessions. As for you, you shall go to your fathers in peace. You shall be buried in a good old age. And they shall come back here in the fourth generation. For the iniquity of the Amorites is not yet complete. Everything that God promised Abram here came true. Everything. But it's in these next verses, I think it's easy to pass over and miss just how incredible God's grace and love is. Verses 17 through 21 read, When the sun had gone down and it was dark, behold, a smoking fire pot and a flaming torch passed between these pieces. On that day, the Lord made a covenant with Abram, saying, To your offspring I give this land from the river of Egypt, to the great river, the river Euphrates, the land of the Kenites, the Kenizzites, the Cadmonites, the Hittites, the Perizzites, the Raphaim, the Amorites, the Canaanites, the Girgashites, and the Jebusites. Nailed it. <laughs> but get this. While the tradition was that both parties would pass through the pieces of the animals, here... Only God passes through. His presence represented by the flames, the furnace, the fiery pot, the torch. God's making it clear this covenant depends on him, not Abram. And you can be certain of its fulfillment because you can be certain of God. God's made another covenant, one that we're called to believe. Another covenant of which we can be certain. The Apostle John tells us in 1 John 5.13, he says, I write these things to you who believe in the name of the Son of God that you may know that you have eternal life. So how is it we may know, not hope or wish, but know that we have God for all eternity? John 19.30, Jesus' broken, bloody body nailed to a cross verse 30 says when Jesus had received the sour wine he said it is finished and he bowed his head and gave up his spirit this phrase in the in the Greek it is finished it's the word tetelestai it's in ancient culture when people went to market and they would have a wax tablet if they ran an account with the merchant they would have a signet ring with their family emblem on it, and they would stamp it into the debt that they owed, and each time they paid on it, it would be marked, say if you owed the merchant $100 for a goat or 100 shekels. I don't know. When you finally had paid off your debt, the merchant would stamp the tablet to telestai, meaning the debt had been paid in full. So what debt was Jesus declaring had been paid in full? It was the debt that our guilt before a holy God had caused. And what should have happened to us happened to Jesus instead. This new covenant between God and man, like the covenant between God and Abram, is a covenant that all who believe can be certain that they have eternal life. And believe what? Believe that there is a God so loving, so amazing, 
that he would die in our place and so powerful that he wouldn't stay dead. Will you pray with me again? And I'll ask uh, Mike to come up and the music team to come back up while we're praying. Father God, thank you, Lord, for, for sending your son, Lord Jesus. We thank you for, for being broken, Lord, to pay the penalty for a debt we could never begin to pay. Pray that, that the truth of what you've done, Lord, would give us certainty. Lord, certainty that we have you forever and that that is the best reward anyone could have. And we thank you for that in Jesus' name. Amen. Good morning. I have the pleasure of leading us through uh, the Lord's Supper this morning, and um, I just want us to think about a couple things that Tony just shared with us as we move towards the Lord's table. I want us to think about what God, how God refers to himself in this passage as our shield, as our shield. And, and I want us to think about what Abram asks that Tony highlighted at the end of his message Abram asks, how can I know? How can you know that God is your shield? Maybe you ask the how can I know question a lot. I do. Maybe your sins and your failures feel so great. How can I know that I won't be condemned? Maybe evil seems so strong in the world, Lord. How can I know that you are doing something about it? Death and disease seem ever-present, Lord. How can I know that you're good and that you love me? As we take the Lord's Supper, we look to and remember the ultimate fulfillment of the covenant God made with Abraham. In, that, in a moment, we're going to hold in our hands God's ultimate answer to the question, how can I know, Lord? Who is the Lord's Supper for? The Lord's Supper is for those, those of you who are Christians here. What does it mean to be a Christian? Have you repented of your sins? Have you placed your trust in Jesus Christ alone for salvation? Then this meal is for you. You don't have to be a member here. You don't have to attend here regularly. If that's true of you, this, this meal is for you. If, if you're still trying to figure out what all that means, I am so glad that you're here. We are so glad that you're here. No one's going to look down on you for sitting in your seat during the meal, and just thinking about what does the death and resurrection of Jesus mean. No one will think less of you. How's it going to work? Um, so I'm somewhat new to this process, so <laughs> bear with me. Um, so everybody's going to come forward if you'd like to partake in two lines down the center. Uh, the bread is gluten-free if that's a, a concern for you. Um, also, um, if you are unable to come down the center, just make eye contact with Benjamin. He, he will be happy to bring the elements to you. Um, and at this time, I'm going to ask our servers to come forward, the Annises and the Wentz. And uh, the band is going to play a song as we, as we begin. Feel free to come forward when you're ready.
take the Lord's Supper together, we remember our shield, Jesus Christ, shattered for us, who took the blow of God's wrath against sin in our place as our substitute. Our Savior really did become like the animals in this covenant with Abraham for us. And so we remember that God fulfills his promises even in our breaking of the covenant. He is faithful to complete the work that he began. The body of Christ broken for you, take in faith. When we take communion, we remember our shield, Jesus Christ, shattered for us, softening the blow of death, removing its sting. We need no longer fear our great enemies, death and the devil, because our Savior shed his blood that we would be forgiven and redeemed to newness of life. The blood of Christ shed for you, take in faith. Praise be to God. Let's stand. The grace of God is reached for me and pulled me from. 
from the raging sea And I am safe on the solid ground The Lord is my salvation I will not fear when darkness falls First Thessalonians chapter 5. Now may the God of peace himself sanctify you completely, and may your whole spirit and soul and body be kept blameless at the coming of our Lord Jesus Christ. He who calls you is faithful. He will surely do it. Go in the grace and peace of the living Jesus to love and to serve his people.